Welcome to the third session of the Mini Medical School, COVID-19, The Way Forward, hosted by the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs. We are excited to have you here today, and we look forward to engaging with you about this last topic in our series, Long COVID. More than half a million people in the United States have died with COVID. We mourn every one of these losses. Over 28 million people in this country have survived COVID. Locally, the Minnesota Department of Health has documented nearly 6,500 Minnesota lives lost to COVID and more than 475,000 who have survived. Now that we have a better understanding of how to treat really sick people, more and more are surviving. Our hospitals and healthcare systems are getting beyond surges and the challenges of operating at or near capacity. Minnesota has done exceptionally well throughout the pandemic, which brings us to today. Providers and survivors are facing the realities for many of living with COVID. These realities are painful, debilitating, and sometimes very overwhelming. Tonight, we will explore the challenges of long COVID, what we know today, what we need to know to help everyone fully recover. The term long COVID is used to describe the condition of people who experience lingering symptoms weeks and months after recovering from their initial COVID infection. Long COVID can affect anyone. The term was developed by patients in their effort to be seen and understood. In recent weeks, the National Institute of Health confirmed dedicated funds, 1.15 billion over four years to research long COVID, also referred to as post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's really important to understand that how sick someone was when they were first infected is not a predictor for if they will have long COVID. In other words, it's not just people who are severely ill and hospitalized with the virus who are still suffering months after getting sick. A recent follow-up study at University of Washington found that one in three outpatient survivors reported they were experiencing at least one symptom as long as nine months after their initial infection. Common symptoms being reported include fatigue, shortness of breath, joint pain, loss of taste and smell, dizziness, and chest pain. I wonder how many of you know someone who has had lingering effects of COVID. To help us put this in perspective, tonight we will hear from someone about her long COVID experience. We'll also talk with healthcare experts who are at the forefront of caring for people who are dealing with long-term effects of COVID. The presentations will be followed by a dialogue and responding to your questions. If you have a question for any of our speakers, please type it in the Q&A box and we will try to address as many as we can in the time we have together. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from some healthcare professionals who've been caring for patients experiencing long COVID. I'll first bring in Dr. Tanya Melnick. Dr. Melnick treats patients affected by long COVID. She is an assistant professor of medicine and an internist in the medical school here at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Melnick, would you please tell us about when you first heard about long COVID and how we've evolved to where we are today, which we know isn't very far, but where are we today? Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm happy to share my experience and experience of some of my colleagues um, that um, are working with me in the long COVID clinic. Um, we probably, I have to admit that uh, uh, we have seen long COVID way before we um, recognize it as long COVID. Um, I was working in virtual urgent care with uh, my colleagues in the beginning of pandemic in the spring of uh, 2020. And we were monitoring patients who um, had suspected COVID because testing was not widely available and a lot of patients ended up staying home, not seeing their doctors. And after a typical two weeks, um, some of the patients were saying that they're still not better. They're not back to normal. 
we really didn't know what to tell them. At the time, the model and the care model was very different. So most of the time when patients are ill, they are told to go see your doctor. With COVID and suspected COVID, the model has shifted to don't go see your doctor. Call someone to talk about your symptoms. And if they're mild, if you're not very short of breath, if you are um, feeling comfortable at home, then stay home. You're going to recover. You're going to be just fine in a couple of weeks. Well, that turned out to be not the case. And we definitely have started to see those patients in the spring. By summer um, and late spring, it was very clear that there is a subset of patients. So there is, there is a small portion of patients that are still significantly bothered by the symptoms that were remaining from their battle with COVID. And um, healthcare providers weren't sure what to do with them. We knew that people who were hospitalized and were um, sometimes put in the ICU on a ventilator, they will be having uh, issues with recovery. We have seen it with some other conditions and we expected to see the same. But it was very unusual to see that many patients because we really had a lot of patients who were sick at the same time to struggle with some of the issues that a lot of people have come to experience as long COVID or post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. And um, by summer, um, patients um, decided that they do need support. They were not getting a whole lot of information from medical community. And frankly, the research was not there either because so many people were coming to the hospital and struggling to breathe, um, most attention initially with research and with clinical care was directed to them. They were the sickest ones, they were dying, they needed help very urgently. So with very limited resources, that's exactly where they went. And initially the long COVID condition really didn't get a whole lot of recognition and a whole lot of support. So I am happy to see that at this point, the uh, attention is shifted um, and both WHO and um, NIH, National Institute of Health, are calling for research in this area, and there's actually funding that's um, going to be there. So we are definitely seeing um, patients um, with COVID, and we're still seeing patients not just this, from the second wave in the fall. There are some people who had illness um, back in the spring of last year, and they're still um, not completely back to normal. So I'm happy to share the slide. I'm really not happy that I have to share it. I'd rather not have this discussion in the first place, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a slide um, that kind of represents the symptoms that we see and our patients bring uh, to our attention when they come to the post-COVID clinic. So, not the right screen, my apologies. Let me bring the right screen to you. But what we typically see in uh, patients, a lot of them are still struggling with significant fatigue. Um, a lot of them um, are having issues with shortness of breath. Um, many patients are still coming in with um, insomnia and loss of sense of um, smell and taste. What has been fairly unique for this is um, struggles that um, many patients um, have noticed is they have difficulties tolerating physical activity. So we do see a fair number of patients who are very healthy and were very healthy to begin with. But unfortunately, after their battle with COVID, they have um, really reduced um, level of um, tolerance of exercise, meaning they start to move around and they literally start to feel that they're running a marathon. Um, they have very rapid heartbeat in response to fairly minimal physical activity, like walking a flight of stairs. And before COVID, they were able to run a marathon or half marathon. They were very physically active. So for many patients, it really is um, very disturbing. Um, and unfortunately, some degree of impairment are um, severe to the point of um, not being able to uh, return to work in full capacity. 
So that is most concerning for uh, many patients. And this is, um, it, this is where we come in to and try to help them. Thanks, Dr. Melnick. I'm wondering if you'd like to briefly explain some of the leading explanations for what's causing long COVID. Um, at this point, they are really hypotheses, so there is really nothing um, that we can say for certain that this is a ha moment and we know exactly what causes it. Um, but there are some studies that you know, indicate that um, people do form antibodies to their own tissues. So some of the in, um, autoimmune um, mechanisms have been implicated. Um, we know that virus can persist, and uh, one of the hypotheses is that the virus is lingering in um, some of the what's called protective sites, such as uh, brain, for example. We can't really detect it with a bloodstream, but sometimes we do find markers of inflammation. And um, sadly, the studies of patients who have died because of COVID have found a virus in nervous tissue. Whether or not that actually happens in patients who suffer from uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID or long COVID, we don't know. Um, and finally, another hypothesis is there is just so much inflammation that happened in this, during initial illness that it just takes time to resolve. So that's still in, um, in the works and still yet to be determined. And um, I'm hoping there is definitely, there's definitely work happening in this area. So I'm really hopeful that we will find um, a mechanism and potentially several mechanisms that are at play and we will understand better how to treat this condition. Thank you so much, Dr. Melnick. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Douglas Whiteside. Dr. Whiteside is a professor of rehabilitation medicine who specializes in cognitive issues and has also been caring for patients surviving COVID. Dr. Whiteside, what can you tell us about some of the cognitive issues or challenges you've been seeing in COVID survivors? Well, thanks. So my, my role um, in rehabilitation medicine is as a neuropsychologist. And that, in, in case you don't know, that's a, a specialist who, who looks at and evaluates cognitive issues, you know, memory, attention, problem solving, a variety of different areas. And, you know, when, when, the whole pandemic started, um, you know, I first began seeing um, patients, uh, thanks to Dr. Kasberzak and the uh, inpatient rehabilitation unit. And there we saw patients who really had a, a really severe course, you know, were in the ICU, on ventilators, and that's still happening. And then those folks are still dealing with cognitive issues. Um, more recently, we've been seeing more of the um, long COVID patients who, who um, you know, as Dr. Melnick was saying, um, and I think Dr. Fulkerson really illustrated well, is that, you know, these folks don't necessarily have the initial severe course where, you know, they're, they're in the hospital for weeks or months and they're on vents and prone and all sorts of uh, bad things. But, you know, and, and those folks are, are having cognitive issues, but What's emerging is that the, the folks who aren't as severe with their initial presentation, who don't end up in the hospital, are still having some, some cognitive issues. Uh, you know, the, the common term is, is brain fog um, or, or the sense of malaise or, or just not feeling like they're, they're functioning full capacity. And so one of our tasks and challenges is to understand exactly you know, what's going on with this and the mechanisms. And as Dr. Melnick, said, and I totally agree with, we don't understand all the mechanisms for why this is going on, but, but there's clearly a phenomenon happening with, with a subset of these folks. And, um, you know, one of the things I've, I've been doing is, is doing some research on this. Um, our department is collaborating on research. And, you know, and I've kind of one of the things just to kind of wrap our, our heads around this as a profession is I, I've developed kind of a model of, of kind of how to think about cognition. And I'm gonna just share that real quick with, with everybody, if you give me just a moment. Um, okay. Uh, I assume everybody can, can see this okay. Um, so yeah, I kind of talk about it stages, but you know, it's, it's really, you know, it could be talked about as, as types or subtypes. But you know, the, as neuropsychologists, I think we're kind of seeing people lumped into three broad categories. Um, 
um, and I think the, the vast majority of people would probably fall in this first stage. And these are very well people we, we might never see. These are the, the population that, that had COVID, um, either laboratory confirmed or presumptive, and, and recovered, and they're not having cognitive issues. A small subset of those folks may come to our attention anyway because of something unrelated to COVID. You know, other neurological issues could be going on, um, external incentive, um, things like that. Um, so, so that's a lot of them, but th that may not be the necessarily the clinical focus for most of, you know, most of us. Um, okay, Oop, skipped ahead, sorry, the button twice. Um, what I call stage two is kind of the mild cognitive symptoms, and mild can be fairly a fairly broad area, but um, these are folks who either were on event or, or maybe not, um, and may or may not have had ICU treatment, but, um, but generally are experiencing some variety of mild cognitive symptoms, and a lot of the, the long COVID folks are experiencing those. Now, when I say mild, I don't mean inconsequential. I mean, this is a clinical term that we use uh, to differentiate mild, moderate, and severe. And, and even folks with mild cognitive difficulties can have an impact. But a lot of the folks, and, and certainly I think this is probably true for most of the folks I would characterize as mild, are able to maintain at least some level of their functional abilities. Um, now they may be impacted by other things like fatigue, um, you know, that's also affecting, you know, cognitive um, COVID patients. Um, some of them have returned to work, but they're receiving feedback that maybe their performance isn't as, as strong. You know, that may, that may be a reason why we come to see them, or they may not be able to return to work for a variety of reasons. Um, but, but a lot of the long COVID patients would fall into here. And then there's also the folks who are having the more moderate to severe symptoms. And these, these could be a, a wide range of folks, but, but these are folks that may have some known um, severe complication, you know, so hypoxia, which means without oxygen or limited oxygen. Um, these are the folks who may have very well been on vents or had just low oxygen levels for a long time. There's some neurological complications that have been seen like stroke, um, ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress, and things like that. Um, these folks are struggling with their activities of daily living, kind of doing day-to-day -day stuff because of the level of their cognitive problems. Um, very unlikely that they're going to be back home or driving, um, or, or if they are, if they are kind of doing some of these things, there's probably some real questions about it. So, so you know, that's kind of how we're thinking about the, the folks who have this, um, and and you know, and, and it could, you know, since it's so new, we're still really trying to understand the whole gamut of everything that we're trying to deal with here. So there's much research going on. Um, I will just say one more thing though, and I always I like this slide because this is this is the hope. Um, at least for the future. So this is the slide, um, the main slide that was in the Pfizer study um, that was published recently in New England Journal of Medicine. And the, it's very dramatic what this vaccine effect has. The blue line that's kind of going up at a 45 degree angle is the placebo group. The red line here that's almost flat is the vaccinated group. And when they talk about 95% effective, this is what they mean. This vaccine, and frankly, all the vaccines are having a dramatic impact. So the hope is that as we get people vaccinated, that this will not become an even more widespread phenomenon. Of course, we still have the folks who have it, have had it, that we have to help. But at least there's hope for the future, and maybe we can prevent a lot more people from getting it. So that's at least a, a brief kind of overview of, of what what we're talking about here from the from the cognitive side. Thanks so much, Dr. Whiteside. Would you just spend a couple minutes talking about the interplay of physical and emotional health with these survivors, regardless of which stage? Um, what are you seeing and how are you thinking about that? So a lot of folks are dealing with, you know, serious stressors, and that that's leading to a, you know, a lot of increase in emotional um, issues, depression and anxiety. Um, and frankly, it's not just people with COVID. I mean, we've been in a pandemic for a year. There's a lot more people who are socially isolated. So there, there's a lot higher incidence of depression and anxiety in the general population. You don't need to have COVID um, to be dealing with that. Um, but then you throw on, you're having chronic medical issues from a disease that we don't totally understand. And so that's just heightened them. 
Now, you know, so we're seeing a lot more depression and anxiety, but it's still an empirical question of how much is, is it those stressor things, which I personally think is probably a big part of it. But, you know, is there also sort of a, a biological component that there's something about COVID that's also driving uh, more depression? Still an empirical question. Um, regardless, I mean, they, they, they need treatment, um, medications, therapy, um, but, but there's definitely an, an interplay both between the, the whole social environment we're in with the distancing and the isolation, and then you throw on a chronic medical condition, and, and it can be very challenging for people. Thank you so much, Dr. Whiteside. And now I'd like to introduce Ms. Melissa Beal. As a nurse care coordinator, Ms. Beal has worked very closely with patients who were and were not hospitalized with COVID. The ambulatory patients were those who managed through their illness mostly at home. She and her team support patients and caregivers by connecting them with the services they need to address their health concerns, as well as barriers to optimal health and well being, including things like insecure housing or food access. Ms. Beale, would you highlight for us some of the biggest challenges survivors with long COVID and their families are facing, and how nurse care coordinators like yourself are helping them? Yes, thank you, Carolyn. And thank you for the opportunity for us to share our nursing care coordination stories with you this evening. The patient stories that I will review with, with you this evening are part of the M Health Fairview Care Coordination Program. The patients that are first diagnosed with COVID are referred to our Get Well Loop, which is an interactive virtual program for COVID patients who agree to participate in the program. Uh, patients can be enrolled in both the Get Well Loop and the Care Coordination Program. Our care coordinators are calling all patients that are suspect COVID-19 or positive COVID-19 following any emergency department or hospital discharge. But our primary care providers are also referring to the Care Coordination Program for any psychosocial resource needs, behavioral health resources, complex medical patients, home, community, or school-based resource needs. The care coordination services are open to all patients who are a part of the M Health Fairview primary care clinics, and there's no fee for the service at this time. Thank you so much, Ms. Beal. Uh, really appreciate those perspectives and painting, uh, painting a picture of the complexity of care that's needed and the resources that um, your area has been able to help um, patients access. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Dr. Michael Kasperzak. Dr. Kasperzak is an assistant professor of rehabilitation medicine in the medical school here at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Kasperzak, would you please share with us your experience launching this long COVID clinic? Why did we need it? We've sort of answered some of that already. How is it helping survivors? Yeah, great, great. Thanks for having me too. And, and um, <clears throat> I guess, first of all, just kind of like Melissa was talking about, uh, uh, a, we need a comprehensive medical team to take care of these patients, whether it's Dr. Melnick's expertise with internal medicine and, and these uh, situations, whether it's kind of a social environment, uh, we need case managers, caretakers, social workers to help with these patients, uh, whether it's kind of a, a cognitive depression, um, any other kind of post-traumatic stress uh, that these patients are going through, having neuropsychology part of the team is, 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 is instrumental. And, and our role and my role is I'm a physiatrist, a physical med and rehabilitation physician. So what we do is see patients on the, we were seeing these patients on the front lines, maybe these more severe cases where they were admitted to the hospital, um, <clears throat> intubated, prolonged ICU course, and eventually these patients get a little better, but they're not quite ready to go home. And so they come to the rehab floor and we have this comprehensive kind of care plan at the rehab floor. And uh, Dr. Morris, our chair of the department um, was starting to notice that these patients would get better. Hopefully for the most part, we get them stronger and, and get them better and get them home. Um, but then we'd also have outpatient follow-ups with these patients. And then not only was it the severe patients that we saw at the rehab center, but we would get these and now we do this mild, moderate, severe kind of labeling with these patients, but a lot of these 
mild quote unquote patients still have these lingering kind of long-term problems that you know the post-COVID clinic was created. And so what the post-COVID clinic is, is basically uh, like Melissa was saying, you're getting kind of a, a team approach for your care. You're not alone. Um, we have a team that's going to help support you, whether it's a medical condition, whether it, kind of like I just said about depression or anxiety or fatigue or social issues. Um, you're going to get almost an inpatient rehab experience, but on an outpatient basis, if that makes sense. So we, we will try to send send you to like a pulmonary rehab program if you need it, if poor endurance, poor conditioning. Uh, we send you occupational therapy to, to work on cognitive uh, tasks and, and, and uh, that cognitive fog. We send you to speech and language if there's issue with, well, swallowing or just memory. Um, we send you for neuropsychology evaluation. We send you to psychology for post-traumatic stress, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, any resource that you kind of need to, to function at home like you used to, we try to figure out a way to provide it to you. Um, and we're finding almost more patients. And if you just do look at the statistics, there's more patients almost that were sick, like Dr. Melnick said, that basically had COVID and recovered at home than almost came to the hospital and was admitted through our inpatient rehab program. So there's definitely a lot of people out there that need our help. And, and that's kind of how the clinic has evolved and it continues to evolve now. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Is there anything more you would like to add at this point, just about the types of patients that you're seeing um, as really these clinics are popping up around the country? Um, yeah, well, like Dr. Melnick has expertise more in the, like the pulmonary and cardiac issues these patients have. Uh, our expertise or the rehab team's expertise is more or less getting you exercising and getting, uh, getting you up and moving again. And so a lot of the patients that I'm seeing, one, have kind of this cognitive fog, like Dr. Whiteside mentioned, this, this lethargy, can't focus throughout the day and, and do the task like they used to, and also this fatigue and this um, uh, poor endurance and the inability to do things like they used to do. Um, I, you know, and so exercise is our, I say the free medicine to get this patient up and exercising again is what, you know, our plan is, our strategy is. And that doesn't mean, you know, wake up tomorrow and, and try to run a marathon, but it's one of those things that we just, you know, want to get you back on a, like a good exercise regimen and slowly build back up your endurance and drive. Um, so those would be the things, cognitive fog, decreased endurance, probably the main things I see. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So at this point, we'll move on to some of the questions that have been submitted by our attendees. And I'll certainly try to redirect or direct some of these questions to some of our panelists, and then uh, pipe in if you have anything that some of you would like to add. Uh, Dr. Melnick, I might start with you. How long after diagnosis is someone considered to have long COVID? Um, this is where a definition varies, um, and um, there is one of the one of the purposes of um, NIH work is to further define this condition. Um, typically, we say that initial four weeks, um, three to four weeks, is where we expect the recovery to happen. After that, up to um, like six to twelve weeks, we're talking about long COVID. That's the UK classification. And after twelve weeks, so three months or more, we're talking about post COVID. But again, this is there is really no standard um, answer. But what we typically say to patients who are, who want to be evaluated in the long COVID clinic, um, see what happens after four weeks. If you're still struggling you definitely um, need to be seen. Obviously talk to your primary care provider, but if primary care provider doesn't have answers, doesn't mean that we're gonna have a lot of answers too, but you're more than welcome to come and see us. Thank you. And I, I do believe that's uh, a reality for a lot of people. They're calling their primary care and we're all trying to sort this out together and uh, they're not having easy answers uh, because right now there aren't that many. One of the um, participants here shared a personal story and asked a question. So I'll just share this. And I think Dr. Melnick, you could start as well. 
I have all the symptoms of long COVID 10 months after initial sickness. However, I've always tested negative for COVID. Recently, I read in a news report that the vast majority of long COVID patients have been, have always tested negative. Uh, could any of you deliver an opinion or some research about this? And I will add um, anecdotally, there are a lot of folks who didn't get access to a test. And I know Dr. Melnick, we've talked about this because last spring, um, tests weren't as available as they are now in most of our country. Um, so welcome your thoughts about this and about testing negative and also about having the symptoms, but you never tested positive or showed antibodies. Yeah, this is not an uncommon situation for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, rolling back 10 months ago, we really did not have a whole lot of tests available. So if um, you were a healthy patient, and you really were told to recover at home, um, we may not have tested you in time. So by the time you came to medical attention, the PCR test, um, the no, no swab, or even saliva test would be negative. Um, in people who had mild disease, um, antibodies may not last very long. So testing um, after a certain time or even um, testing shortly after illness, some people just don't have antibodies. Um, there are some studies um, that have looked at uh, T lymphocyte responses, so just different type of cell, um, and they can detect some of the T cells that recognize the virus. So there is a way to prove it, but right now it's mostly limited to research studies and not used in clinical practice. Our approach is um, to treat the patient who has clinical um, symptoms consistent with COVID and test negative to still treat them about same. Um, some of the symptoms that we see in um, long COVID and post COVID um, overlap with some of the other conditions we have seen after other viral infections. Um, and there is really not a specific treatment um, aimed toward COVID-19 after several weeks. It's pretty much the same focus on rehabilitation, um, working, trying to figure out what's making people short of breath, why they having cognitive issues, why they have some um, other issues that we see in terms of exercise tolerance. And the goal is to typically get them back to a better functional level. So we don't necessarily have to chase after the evidence that somebody had a virus. We really have to focus on recovery in, and improving their quality of life. Thank you so much, Dr. Melnick. And um, just to be clear, some of those other lessons learned from post-viral infections do include folks who are suffering, for example, with chronic fatigue syndrome. Thank you. I'm going to um, jump to Dr. Whiteside with a question. Are there certain cognitive domains that are more likely to be affected by COVID? And the follow-up, uh, not related, but I'm just going to put out there as well, uh, supplements, are those helpful in this space? So those are good questions and, and we don't have a lot of good answers yet. So that's a common theme, right, with COVID. Um, one of the paper that we just uh, published on this our, our, our severe COVID patients showed a tendency to have some memory issues and some issues with what we call executive functioning. And uh, so executive functioning is kind of a broad area of, of abilities, but it's basically uh, abilities that go into like decision-making and problem solving, like reasoning, judgment, organization, those sorts of things. And so that, that was one pattern, but it was a small number of patients. Um, similar, um, like viral um, infections that, have, that affect the brain, you often will see these sorts of issues, but you also see like attention, focusing attention, processing speed. Um, so those are, those are hypotheses of what could be most impacted. Um, but honestly, the research is at such an early stage that, you know, that we need to do a lot more um, digging. But um, I will say anecdotally, the patients that I've seen um, tend to vary. Um, not all of them are showing memory, not all of them are showing executive functioning 
or attention or processing speed. It's really federal, uh, fairly, um, fairly diverse. So that um, uh, that presents some real challenges um, in terms of just understanding it. So once again, it, it, those are the areas that we would most likely expect, um, but not everybody is showing up with those. And and you know some of that overlaps with just fatigue and stamina too, but there could be some some neurological issues. And that doesn't even get into the severe folks who've had like seizures and strokes. That's a whole new ballgame. But this is just the mild folks. In terms of supplements, since I'm not a medical provider, I'm going to kind of defer to my medical colleagues on on that one, though. Sure. Which one? Which one would like to take that one? Yeah, supplements. I, I won't get into supplements, but what I will get into is exercise. Exercise. You know be upset or not, it's easier said than done, but exercise is going to be the free supplement and the, the free gateway to help your brain uh, recover. It builds great neurotransmitters. It gives you endorphins that you can't get from any supplement or from any um, medication really. And the tough part about this and the recovery is that, you know, you're weak and you can't get up and do things and you can't like, get around like you used to but that's where like the rehab team and this post COVID clinic is supposed to help you and guide you and get you back up kind of exercising, uh, in a controlled environment. And I, anecdotally, I guess, as like we've been seeing in this whole experience this last year, you know, the patients that do do the best are the ones that kind of complete the therapy program. They do the exercise, they, they, they go to the therapy sessions and they, you know, they participate. I know it's not easy, it's not easy if you don't have COVID to exercise every day, but, you know, getting at least 20 to 30 minutes of exercise at least four times a week is like one of the best things to do for your brain overall. <clears throat> and I would just add on to what Dr. Kasperzak said, and it also is quite helpful for mental health. Um, you know, it's actually commonly uh, prescribed for depression, for anxiety. And it has not only the physical benefits that, that Dr. Kasperzak mentioned, but it also has real noticeable mental health benefits. So it's good for many, many reasons. Thank you so much. So Dr. Melnick, um, I think that Dr. Kasperzak has deflected. What about supplements, vitamins? <laughs> we'll, we'll, put it, we'll put it on you. Excellent questions. Um, I, I actually second what my colleagues have already said. Exercise is the best supplement that you can possibly get. Um, in uh, United States has probably one of the biggest supplement market in the world. They're hugely popular. Um, the sad part about supplements is the research into supplements is really very limited. So it's really hard to know which supplement is actually doing what they claim to do. And that's the reason um, most of the supplements go under label, it may help. Um, so the approach we typically take is we live in Minnesota. So one supplement everybody could definitely use is vitamin D. Checking your vitamin D level with a physician um, to make sure that you know what dose to take and uh, potentially fixing the deficiency would be the right approach as far as the general idea with supplements. Um, again, vitamin D is interesting because all the research that's been done kind of pinpoints toward vitamin D deficiency as one of the risk factors for severe COVID. Sadly, the research that vitamin D supplementation prevents severe COVID has not panned out. So, so far that's been the rule with pretty much everything in vitamin D supplementation, whatever risk factor vitamin D is, um, supplementing vitamin D helps nothing but by fixing vitamin D deficiency. So check with your doctor, you're deficient, it's a good idea to address it. It's probably not gonna help you feel a whole lot better, but at least you're not gonna run losing your bone density. It's not gonna be the risk. As far as approach with supplements, um, another um, part we take, if patient really wants to try a supplement, it would be a good idea to actually figure out what is the reason you want to take the supplement. Put down that specific reason, come up with your physician with a scale that you're gonna use to kind of figure out how bad your symptoms are, start the supplement. 
And if you see some improvement, well, that's great. But the next step would be to actually stop the supplement for about a month and see if that changed how you feel. Long COVID is sort of one of the conditions that can come in, uh, in waves. So sometimes people feel better, sometimes people feel worse. And whether or not you started to take a supplement when that wave was really bad, and now you're recovering and would have recovered even without the supplement, you won't really know until you try. So that requires even more work if you really um, want to know if the supplement is helping you in particular. Um, that actually takes quite a dedication to figure out how to do it. Um, other than that, and that's again, that's a work with your primary care provider who will be helping you figure out how to actually sort of set up this, this study for yourself. But at best right now, um, all the supplements, if you are taking them, there is really no good signs that they do help with the, with the post-COVID symptoms. So hopefully that's gonna change in the future, but that's where we're we at right now. Thank you so much. And if you do go to your healthcare provider and ask about checking vitamin D, ask if insurance is covering it because I've heard recently that some have um, made some changes because everyone's asking for their vitamin D level to be tested these days. Um, so there's a question here about the approximate percentage of patients diagnosed with COVID that ultimately have long COVID. And I think what I'll do is just reframe that and just simply say that there, there are more and more uh, surveillance studies coming out showing anywhere from 10% to 30, 33, 35%. So we'll know more in the days ahead, especially since now NIH is looking to fund studies that will exactly start to um, uh, tell us more and better uh, what's going on with the, with the data. But even that, with the 28 million so far plus who have survived in this country, if we take 10 to 30% of that number, that's a big number of people who are affected in, in one or many ways uh, might have challenges returning to work, for example, um, there, there just could be a lot going on there and that's, that's a lot of people. Could someone speak to patients with long COVID being contagious past their acute infectious stage? And I think this could align with one of the leading arguments for um, cause in that there is still virus in the body. Dr. Melnick, do you want to take that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, so far, the evidence that people are contagious beyond those initial two weeks um, is coming from studies um, looking to culture out a live virus. So just having a positive PCR may not be enough. Um, you really need to, sh to be shedding a virus that is alive and ready to infect other cells. We have not seen it in majority of patients. So that comes with, with a big, there are some exceptions. So people who were a lot sicker, who were um, in the ICU on um, steroids or other medications that are immunosuppressive in nature. So um, other medications have been used to sort of calm down all the inflammation that the virus has caused. They can be contagious beyond that two weeks. So if somebody was in the ICU intubated on steroids and on some of the medications um, that we have used to treat um, the virus, and that's mostly right now in this country, um, tocilizumab, um, they can be contagious for up to 21 days. And that's a CDC recommendation. There are some even more rare um, exam um, examples of people who really had the live virus lingering for a very long time. Um, there are some sad studies of people who never cleared the virus who actually died of COVID after I would say three months of that actually not just being tested positive but having the live virus. Those people are very heavily immunosuppressed. They're typically on therapy to treat um, blood cancers. Um, or they're very heavily immunosuppressed for um, some severe autoimmune condition or have, have a um, bone marrow or organ transplant. But those are fairly notable exceptions. And usually we know who those people are and um, they're not healthy and walking around. They're, they're pretty sick and in the hospital. So for majority of patients, they don't shed the virus beyond two weeks 
that is dangerous to others. They may harbor it in um, some of the tissues, but we have not seen it um, come from the outside. So if they test positive with the PCR, it doesn't necessarily mean that there, there is a live virus ready in fact to infect others. And just a quick follow-up um, with, uh, with um, long COVID, can folks get reinfected, get an acute infection of COVID again? And then um, maybe Dr. Kasperzak, you want to take that and, and add your comments as well. Just like Dr. Malnick said, but our experience on the, on the rehab floor when we'd have these patients through the ICU, immunosuppressed or not, you know, early on, we would, this patient would be day 30, day 40, asymptomatic, exercising more and more, getting stronger and stronger every day, no fever, no cough, no chills, look really, really well. And they would just test positive on the PCR just because they had remnants of the virus, you know, in, in their body. And, and, and so, yes, there's like a two week and then a 21 day, and then sometimes even a longer time frame depending on the immunosuppression. Um, and Dr. Malnick can probably correct me, but what we've kind of been using is this kind of three month rule, like uh, 90 days. Uh, Dr. Malnick will probably be better served for this question, but probably like 90 days you are kind of immune. And then after these 90 days, um, there may be risk for reinfection, but Dr. Melnick might be able to elaborate on that more. <clears throat> so what we know from some of the observation studies, and there was one recently published that people um, who do have antibodies, so um, those, are, those would be the people who actually test positive for the antibodies, um, they do not um, have a very high risk of infection. Um, the risk of reinfection was about 0.3% as opposed to actually about 3%. So I'm happy to put that study um, in, um, in references in the future. Um, but the risk of reinfection appears to be fairly low within the initial three months. It's still possible. It kind of depends on a lot of different things. After that, the antibodies, um, at least the protection um, starts to go down. So we unfortunately start to see some of the repeat cases overall. Um, the risk of reinfection tends to be fairly low, which is very encouraging for both people who had COVID and for, for the vaccine. So that's really exciting. But that kind of brings me to the next point. Um, yes, there is definitely some protection from having natural infection. Um, it does not appear to be 100% proof for prevention of reinfection. So that brings up um, a valid point that CDC is recommending vaccinated people or vaccinating people who had COVID already. Um, the 90 days wait period between having acute illness and um, vaccination is not mandatory. Um, we just didn't have a whole lot of vaccine to begin with. So that 90 day recommendation came out in terms of vaccine conservation strategies. Um, if you had COVID and um, your risk of infection in the next three months is fairly low. Hey, you can actually wait for the vaccine just a little bit so we can vaccinate somebody who's not protected. Fortunately, with three vaccines um, that are um, available now, and their Minnesota is definitely getting um, J and J uh, this week, which makes me very happy and very excited. Um, we should vaccinate everybody. And unless you obviously have contraindications, there are very few, fortunately, um, because that makes um, the protection um, a lot stronger compared to just having a natural infection. Um, whether or not people need one or two shots, that remains to be seen with Johnson & Johnson. Fortunately, that's not a question. You can definitely go ahead and just get one dose and be done with it. Um, but what we see is the immune response in people who had COVID um, appears to be stronger. So the antibody titers do go higher compared to somebody who has not had COVID. Um, and those are the protective antibodies. So again, that's very encouraging. Um, there is definitely a chance that people will have more significant side effects, but they're not going to linger forever and ever. Um, we don't have a lot of studies, but from personal experience, seeing patients who had COVID and who got vaccinated subsequently to that, they do report that their symptoms are not changing that much. Maybe a couple of days, they come in feeling off, 
But after that, they either feel better, which is kind of interesting, or they're feeling back to what they were like before they got the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Melnick. And I'll just go right from that topic into long COVID. So we don't yet probably have enough data to show that if you are vaccinated, it will prevent long COVID. Um, so say you're vaccinated, you have an acute infection, you might not be hospitalized or at risk of death, but um, do we know yet that a vaccination might prevent long COVID? And then a second related, there are some folks who have long COVID, they've been vaccinated and they've noticed some improvements. And there are some scientists starting to explain some possible reasons um, for that modest improvement, including T cell response, antibody response, going after any lingering virus, um, innate immunity helping with the autoimmune issues. So um, please feel free to elaborate on either of those pieces and then we'll move on from vaccinations. All right, I guess I'm gonna take this question if that's okay. Um, so as far as uh, the, the first uh, part, um, well, actually, I think I'm going to start with just the whole thing with long COVID and whether or not you're going to get better. So in terms of um, vaccine, um, there is definitely a theory that if the virus is persisting, the vaccine can potentially help direct the immune system toward that lingering virus. Um, that's how we use vaccines um, in treatment of some cancers. We sort of train the immune system to recognize the cancer and um, help eliminate it. So there is definitely a theory that it may help um, how it works and, now, and whether or not that works, because right now it really is just a case by case um, evidence. There are a handful of cases of people who are reporting that they're feeling better. Some people report that they're not that feeling that different. So we may um, see ultimately um, what is um, the cause of those persistent symptoms in patients. And if it is a lingering virus and vaccine is helping, how do we, we identify the best timing for the vaccine and whether or not people who are struggling with it can get the vaccine and get better, that overall remains to be seen. So we don't know what drives long COVID. So to say that the vaccine is gonna be the cure for it, I'm not ready to commit to that statement. I'm still gonna recommend vaccination for everybody um, who can get vaccinated um, because what we know from other vaccines is if you get, uh, even if you get a natural disease following vaccination, that tends to be less severe. So even um, with the vaccine, if you do get sick for other conditions, people just don't get sick as much and they don't have the same sequelae. So that's true with measles, that's very true with influenza. So even if you don't have a complete protection and you still get the disease after the vaccine, you're a lot less likely to end up in the hospital. You're a lot less likely to end up in the ICU. You're a lot less likely to have all of the sequelae. And that we, that's what we see with influenza. Obviously, COVID-19 is not influenza, and we don't have studies that show that uh, people who get sick after getting vaccinated don't develop long COVID with the same rate. The truth is, right now, vaccine is probably one of the best prevention strategies because if you don't have the disease, you're not going to get long COVID. Thank you. Let's answer a few that I think are a little bit easy to answer. So a question about a son who had a positive COVID test early November, still dealing with changed smell and taste, uh, certainly taking a toll mentally. Is this enough to be seen at a post COVID clinic? I'm happy to take it if, if Mike, if you're, if, you, if you're okay with that. Um, so um, change in the taste and smell are really um, complex um, issues. Uh, we unfortunately see them lingering for six months and sometimes longer, and they are connected. Um, sense of smell is very complex, and actually it contributes to our sense of taste. 
when we chew food, the air that's mixed with food actually gets into the back of the nose and gives us the complexity. So people who start to recover from loss of taste and smell, initially they regain those basic smells, they basic, basic taste. So they taste salty, they taste sweet, they taste bitter. They don't have all the complexity that actually is contributed by the nose. Um, as far as um, treatment for it, um, again, research is definitely happening in that regard. And um, there are a couple of things that have been tried, including um, olfactory uh, rehab. So it's recovering your sense of smell by actually practicing and um, sniffing different things. Um, and ENT or otolaryngology, they have been working with it for quite some time. It has been seen with some other conditions, including some of the viruses. And that's one other approach that they take. Um, other approach would be to potentially treat it with a steroid nose spray. Again, that should be done with a consultation with a physician. And there is some data that it could be helping. But again, it can take a very long time. Obviously, you're more than welcome to come to post COVID clinic if it's really bothersome. We're happy to help you. Um, but again, sort of on the fly, what potentially could be done because it could be very disturbing. People lose appetite and some of them um, have lost weight and it's, it's just overall not very enjoyable experience for sure. Yep, yeah, definitely. Dr. White said, I'm going to bring a question to you. Uh, what's the research with people who have ADHD, ADD, and they're now experiencing additional cognitive issues related to long COVID? And we might even broaden that. Are you seeing other relationships with, with pre-existing or previous diagnoses that seem to be then affected one way or another uh, once that person has survived COVID? Yeah, so there, there's honestly just no research on that yet. I mean, it's, it's so nascent. It's, it's, it's a good question, but it's not been studied, at least with COVID. I mean, there are, you know, anytime somebody has a, a pre-morbid condition, if you will, you know, that's something that existed before you got sick. Um, the, it, there's a risk that it could interact with a disease entity. So, um, you know, that doesn't have to just be ADHD, but that's, you know, a good one. If somebody has some pre-existing issues and then they, they get COVID, that, that could make them more vulnerable. It's a great question. It just has not been studied in a systematic way yet. I mean, we don't even have a lot of good you know, kind of basic fundamental studies, let alone like all the possible interactions. So it's a great question, but I, I it's, it's definitely possible. Um, but, you know, it would, it would, it would definitely be, you know, needed to take a look at it at an individual level. Thank you. So I'm not sure who will want to answer this. I'm going to combine a couple other questions about possible treatments. Folks have brought up blood thinners. They've also brought up uh, CBD or THC. Uh, as possibly being helpful in terms of long COVID. Who would like to answer a few of those questions? I can speak on the blood thinners. Um, blood thinners um, are typically recommended at this point for people who were hospitalized um, and um, have been assessed to be high risk for um, blood clots um, during um, their recovery. So a lot of patients are coming um, from, uh, home from the hospitalization on about a month long um, therapy with a blood thinner. Um, there is really no research that blood thinners help with long COVID, although um, whether or not blood clots actually contribute to the damage that we see, um, a lot of times once the initial inflammation has subsided, um, we just don't see a whole lot of blood clots. Um, again, we have definitely seen it with, um, with long COVID. So I'm not going to make it a rule and I'm not going to say, no, no, it's not indicated under any circumstances. It is right now. There's just not enough research to recommend anticoagulation for everyone who has been diagnosed with COVID. So it's restricted to patients who were in the hospital and who are coming home on um, blood thinners. Um, uh, who Go wants ahead. to take the CBD question? We have about a minute left with questions. 
Uh, anyone want to answer the CBD question? I can only I can only speak to um just the the one patient experience that I that I had and it was with the polyneuritis and um unfortunately it, it's it's very ex expensive um there's no insurance that that covers it so she wasn't able to to use it um she I mean you have to go through the the dispensary in order to get it and it, it she wasn't able to utilize it enough to notice any benefit um and so she did decide to go more of the the medical um, pain management route and she she actually didn't like the way that it made her her feel so she decided not to pursue it any any further um it, she didn't find it any more effective than the than the other medications that she, that she was taking thank you so much mm -hmm. so i know there are additional questions and we'll be doing our best effort to answer those um in follow up after this um session ends this evening now I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Osterholm, Director of the University's Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy and a member of President Biden's COVID-19 Advisory Board. He will share some concluding reflections with us regarding COVID-19 and our way forward. Hi, I'm Mike Osterholm. I direct the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy here at the University of Minnesota and uh, am very pleased to be able to provide these last parting thoughts to you in terms of your experience at Mini Medical School. I'm so glad that you were able to attend. I think it is one of the unique uh, opportunities at the University of Minnesota for us in the health sciences to provide the community uh, with that kind of information that uh, can help them understand the complexities of the medical uh, problems we face, the public health issues. And so it's great to actually be with you here uh, today. Uh, the whole pandemic of COVID-19 has been a journey, a long journey, a painful journey. Just to remind people that as much as we in the uh, public health sciences and medical care deal with patients, we deal with populations, we often find ourselves talking about numbers, numbers of cases, number of deaths. And I think the most important thing that we all must remember from our own basic humanity is every one of these numbers is a person. Everyone is someone who is someone's grandfather, or grandmother, someone's father or mother, someone's son or daughter, someone's brother or sister. And that's hard sometimes when we talk about the kinds of numbers of cases that we've confronted over the past year. I think a, a sobering way to understand the impact that this disease has had just here in the United States, let alone around the world, is to look at the number of reported deaths. To date, well over 500,000 people in this country have died from COVID-19 just in the last 12 months. Uh, I'm, that number is likely even higher than that in terms of the missed cases that didn't get recorded as COVID-19 related. To give you a sense of what that 500,000 feels like, imagine if every three seconds you cited a name, John Smith, Ann Smith, and if I did that, that would be 20 names a minute that I could say. To understand the depth of what this virus has done to us, if I did try to announce every name of those who have died in the past year, it would take me 17 and a half days nonstop of just reciting a name every three seconds. That gives you a sense of just what this has done. Globally, the impact has been also of great, great, great public health concern. For the first time since World War II, we have actually seen the average life expectancy in this country drop. Amazing, challenging. But by attending many medical school, you understand what we're trying to do here at the University of Minnesota to change that course. Our center in particular has been involved from the very earliest days. On January 20th of 2020, I put out a statement indicating that there was clear and compelling evidence that this new virus, SARS-CoV-2, was going to emerge into a global pandemic. This was some two months before the WHO declared the pandemic uh, occurring. Um, our goal has all along been to provide the public with uh, comprehensive, authoritative, and current information on what's happening. As I deliver this message to you today, we're all basically waiting 
concerned that the next shoe may drop, that although we're enjoying this big decrease in cases from the high in January of almost 300,000 cases a day, now down to about 80,000 cases a day, don't forget that that 80,000 cases per day in this country still exceeds the 70,000 cases per day in last July's surge or the 25 to 28,000 cases a day in the last April surge. Um, we have come to almost accept and settle for a new baseline. Our challenge is where do we go from here? Even though we have vaccines right now, which are our gifts in terms of our ability to take on this virus, we won't have nearly enough vaccine for everyone in this country for at least four months. And in the meantime, we're now worried about a new problem, a new surge of cases that could very well occur beginning early in March and, and extending well into April. And that is caused by these new variants, these new viruses that have mutated uh, such that now today they can do one of three different things or a combination thereof. One, they can cause uh, much more serious illness than the previous strains of the virus. Number two, they're more transmissible. In some cases, 30 to 70% more transmissible or more infectious. And number three is that they can actually evade the immune protection afforded by vaccination or natural disease. Right now, we're worried about variant B117 that originated in the United Kingdom that is now spreading widely through the United States. This is one that has the characteristics of that first two buckets of variants of concern, both much more highly transmissible and also that of more severe illness. If we look to our colleagues in Europe and what we've seen happen there, note that many of the countries there and in the Middle East have been on lockdowns since Christmas time just to try to deal with the B117 uh, virus uh, and what it's done to their communities. Uh, and this is one that could very easily take the numbers of cases here in the United States to an all-time high. The vaccine is coming, but as we have in our recent report from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy showing that at the rate that we're vaccinating right now, we will still have over 30 million Americans 65 years of age and older who will not have had access to vaccine by the end of March, a time when this virus very well could be surging. So. Our goal here again at the University of Minnesota is to do whatever we can, whether it's in basic research uh, at the bench to understand more about the virus and treatments, how to provide better clinical care, or as such in our group in public health, how do we provide you with current comprehensive and authoritative information? How do we make policy decisions about what we must do to try to reduce the impact of this virus? And let me just leave you with one last thought. You know, uh, when you think about taking care of us, we often think about us, meaning the United States. If there was ever a time when we need to take care of the world, it's now with COVID-19. And this is not just a humanitarian uh, statement. While that is surely true, one of the concerns that we have, and, and, and it will surely come home to roost to us if we don't deal with it directly, is if we continue to see widespread transmission of this virus in low and middle income countries, where today they have very little, if any, access to vaccines, the ongoing transmission there of the virus will spin out more of these genetic mutant viruses, these variants, of which some of them very easily could defeat our vaccines of today. So a way to prevent our vaccines from becoming obsolete or only at least minimized in their impact is to make sure that we vaccinate the world. We need a global effort right now of the highest priority to make sure that we do that. It's strategic, it's wise. It's what will give us some opportunity down the road to get back to a new normal. So again, thank you very much for joining us here in Mini Medical School. I hope that you found it to be informative. I hope that you found it to be challenging because we need all of us to be thinking today about the problems ahead and how can we deal with them more effectively. And I just want to close by saying, I'm now in my 46th year here at the University of Minnesota. The days that I also spent at the Minnesota Department of Health, I was still full-time faculty here at the U. It has been a gift to be part of the University of Minnesota. I can't imagine our center or me being anywhere else but this place. Um, it has fostered the kind of, of some, uh, education, research, and activities that you're hearing about through Mini Medical School and also our own activities in the School of Public Health. Well, thank, thank you so much for your time, for your effort, 
And I hope again that uh, the next time we talk, it's about how we captured, conquered, and moved beyond COVID-19. But then come listen to the lecture about the next pandemic, and we can talk about it then. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers for your time and for sharing your insights into long COVID. A big thank you to you, our participants in the mini medical school for joining us in conversation and discovery. Let us know what you enjoyed, what you would like to learn more about. Reach out to us anytime. We too are patients and family members. We're getting through this pandemic together. We are your healthcare providers, your researchers, your University of Minnesota. Thank you and good evening.